Welcome to uh, Context at WatchMojo in New York City. So some of you may be asking, why is WatchMojo, that is known for top 10 lists on movies, TV shows, and gaming on YouTube, why do we care about this topic of journalism and investor friction? Um, and that's a good question, right? So 15 years ago, we launched WatchMojo with a vision to inform and entertain with a video on every topic. We did everything, you know, service, reference journalism, we did Q and A's, we covered, you know, world wars, we, we were doing top 10 lists on, uh, you know, celebrities. And we realized we needed to get more focused if we were going to survive as an independent media company. If WatchMojo was being branded as a consumer facing brand, well, we had to stand for something. So 10 years ago, we realized that in the future, geek culture was going to become pop culture. What does that mean? So if you were growing up uh, you know, reading comic books, as you get older and you go work in Hollywood or Madison Avenue or Wall Street, well, you were going to sponsor, underwrite, or back these projects that today look like MCU, Game of Thrones, and whatnot. And if I would have told you that Big Bang Theory would be the highest rated show, you would think that that's crazy, right? And if I told you that like Marvel, the, these obscure characters, the Avengers were gonna be like the highest grossing movies, you would have said, no, those are niche franchises for geeks. But that did happen and, and WatchMojo was able to ride that wave and become a proxy for that and, and remain independent. So similarly, today, I think most of you would agree that Entrepreneurship is no longer niche. Entrepreneurship used to be the weirdos that kind of took those risks, the outlaws, the misfits, and kind of wanted to walk to the beat of their own drum. But like Shark Tank has been around for a decade, and Mark Cuban is, is like omnipresent, and kids grow up not wanting to be doctors and lawyers uh, or hedge fund managers or investment bankers, but they actually want to be Mark Zuckerberg and they want to build these apps and, and whatnot. So when, when the debt spin, which takes us to the debt spin story. So when, when the debt spin story broke, I think we all read it from different vantage points, right? I think you, know, you have a very unique perspective and we'll, we'll introduce everybody. Um, you know, Raju was the former CEO of Gizmodo Group, right? So, I mean, definitely I was like, if we're gonna do this little get together, it would be great to have you on. Kerry, now at CNN, previously at Digiday and Mashable, uh, which got acquired by Ziff Davis, um, but, you know, has been covering this broad space uh, for a few years, and Rafat, whom I've known for 20 years, has been essentially, you know, a journalist, an operator in media, an entrepreneur, uh, a storyteller, a journalist, and, and also a salesperson who's kind of pushing forth his ideas. But what my vantage point that's interesting is, as we we keep hearing these lofty ideals that the debt spin folks have, how you know they they are you know anti let's call it anti corporate, pro labor, pro union. You know, I always think that they're always going to be somewhat disappointed regardless of who the investor is and regardless of who the corporate ownership group is. And so I was looking at more from an angle of entrepreneurship and we launched Context this year as another brand in our portfolio that looks at that. It looks at life through the lens of entrepreneurship um, in, in, the, in the sense that, you know, not everybody is an entrepreneur, but everybody has to be entrepreneurial. So that's basically like what I guess the connective tissue. Um, to start off, I don't know if I did justice uh, introducing you, but uh, I wanted to dive right in. Um, historically, the friction in media has really been about like the church and state, advertisers and editorial, and that's been kind of always this, this wall that separates them. Of late, it seems to be more about owners, the ownership group, and the editorial. Is that limited, Raju, in your opinion, to the former Gawker crowd? Or is that something that more and more is going to be a source of friction in media and journalism? Well, I think it is still largely church and state, right? Because the ownership is deciding what the revenue models should be. And I think that's sometimes is the cause of the friction. Um, and if you look at the Wall Street Journal, when Dow Jones was owning it, um, the owners were kind of in the background. When Rupert Murdoch bought it, obviously the owner became very central to the existence of the paper. So in that sense, I think it's still this issue of the newsroom kind of figuring out what kind of constraints are being put on them or whether the revenue models are putting undue burdens on the journalism. I think that's still the case. Obviously with, um, with uh, the old Gawker media sites, uh, the ownership m made some decisions uh, in the last few weeks that seem kind of directly aimed at the ethos of those sites and I can see why that becomes a flashpoint. Okay. Um, I wanted to switch gears and talk a little bit about the New York 
kind of ingredient that explains the predicament that the Deadspin writers found themselves in. You know, you'll always hear like New York is a you know, heavily pro-labor city and all that. You've worked at Mashable, you've now, you then moved to Digiday, you're now at CNN, very different organizations. You keep hearing about the pressure on cost models and all that. Do you think that fundamentally, um, media organizations can have their cake and eat it too by setting up shop in what is ultimately a very expensive city at a time when revenue pressures are heavier than ever and all the money is supposedly going to the Googles and the Facebooks. Take us through your own experiences at the previous organizations when you know revenue was in there, they wanted to cut yeah. costs, and how do you balance that with keeping an operation in New York? Well, I think to like speaking of New York, they decided to stay in New York because I think the majority of leadership was here and they wanted to keep it that way. But they did move offices like pretty like early on, like so they did decide to cut the costs like that way. And I think that's one thing that, from my personal experiences as well, I remember when I was at Mashable and they got bought. One of the first things that they thought was going to be let go was the office because it was an expensive piece of real estate. But they decided to keep it for other reasons. So I think yeah, whenever a company gets acquired, you look at like okay where. Where will you cut, whether it's the office space or specific verticals as well? You know, like when Great Hill decided to take it over, they didn't immediately say, okay, we're cutting this team and this team and this team because we don't think they're bringing in enough revenue. To give them a little bit of credit, they decided to take some time and be like, okay, we own all these properties. Which ones are we going to invest in and which ones are we not? And now we're just starting to see, maybe we had suspicions and, and inklings of which ones were going to go, but they just started to make the, the moves there. When it comes to like New York media though, I don't think they were like, okay, screw it, we're just gonna have like freelancers all over, we don't care where they're based. They still had a reason to stay here. So, so my, yep. let me give you my two cents on this. So I think the, the challenge in, I've been a journalist that's covered media for 20 years now, and not a not a day-to-day -day reporter now, but I'm owner of media, and um, the, the challenge, is that nothing is binary. I mean, in this world, nothing is binary. And the, the conversation that happens and gets hijacked, which unfortunately doesn't stay in, say, social media, has real life effects on people that are in the companies, whether it's owners or the employees, becomes binary because that's, that's all the conversation that happens. This is evil, this is not. They're idiots, they're not. Um, and just the world doesn't work that way. I mean, you live in this world, I live in this world. So the same Great Hill Partners that's being vilified now is the same company that bought Ziff Davis and actually rescued it and now is a thriving company. So private equity for, you know, private equity bad, everybody else great. There's a lot of history in private equity that sucks because there's a sort of a, uh, private equity's reason, reason for existence is to buy companies that are, well, a portion of private equity's reason for existence is to buy companies that are in, on the down curve and then milk what is left of them and then make money off them. There's a whole different type of PE that's focused on growth equity or, or growth that's very much structured like venture or uh, if not the same returns but structured like that. So um, in the debt spin case, my frustration as, and which I cannot publicly sort of write on this anymore, is that everything becomes binary. And did the owners make lots of mistakes? Of course they did. Um, are the journalists that only look at their own point of view in the world navel gazing? Of course they are. And so the answer is pretty much everything else in life is not the sexiest answer, but the answer is always in the middle somewhere, which is great. So that's, I didn't answer your question, but unfortunately that is the answer. No, that's great. You cover whatever question you'd like. Uh, <laughs> so to point. that point, the non-binary, I was going to say, like, is the salvation for journalism and storytelling to prosper, is it corporate ownership? Is it investor, and even investors, there's not there's different types of investors. Is it a wealthy individual, or is it creator-owned? And I mean, even look at wealthy individuals, for example. You had Chris Hughes, who bought the New Republic, 
That didn't go well, and again, lots of reasons. You have Jeff Bezos that bought the Washington Post, that I think most would agree has been a good example of him not necessarily being too hands-on and, and Washington Post mounting a nice little comeback story, so to speak. So which one do you think is the most like optimal scenario for journalism, storytelling to really succeed and thrive in the future? The answer to your original question is yes, right? Meaning that all of them are <laughs> possibly good stewards of journalism. And there are examples of good and bad in every one of those kinds of ownership. I think where, where historically journalism has kind of done well is when the ownership has not kind of interfered in the day-to-day -day operations of it. Bezos being a very good example of that from everything one hears, which is that he's told them um, there's a financial runway. And I think he very smartly, and this hasn't really been talked about much, he very smartly told them that if you make profits, you can keep those. So he's like incentivized them to actually think of generating profits out of even though they have a runway and not think of it as a permanent kind of a cushion. Look, the New York Times as a public company seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, in fact, I think is one of the examples of media companies that are really thriving these days. Um, the Texas Tribunes of the world, the ProPublicas of the world, which are raising money entirely through um, kind of either membership or through donations seem to be doing well. So I think in every one of those, there are examples of um, both good journalism and sustainable business models seem to be thriving. I mean, Rafat is a good example of individuals have given him money, but not a lot of, and a lot of them have done it. But it's, again, I think if they leave him alone to kind of figure out what the model is and how to grow, I think the problem becomes when you take money that comes in with certain assumptions of growth. Right? And if you then accept that, then you have to accept the consequence of not delivering the results. I mean, I, would, I was at Gizmodo Media Group and before that at News Corp, and there would be these stories about, oh my God, BuzzFeed is really not doing well because instead of growing at 50%, they're growing at 40%. Right? And I would sit there and go, I would take 40% to the bank about six times, guys, <laughs> in this industry. Sure, the people who gave them money expected them to grow at 50 or 100%. I think that's the real issue. The expectations game is the real problem as opposed to what kind of money it is. I've heard sometimes, it's more, more meant as a joke, but they're like, even under Gawker, it seemed to be like the inmates are running the asylum. Univision couldn't make it work, and then Great Hill also couldn't. Is this more specific to the culture, this kind of wild, wild west culture of the, 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 the writers at that company, or do you think that, no, it's more the, the, on the ownership side that they couldn't manage it. Look, you shouldn't underestimate the impact of PTSD, right? I mean, this is a newsroom that has collectively gone through hell because of the, like, the lawsuits, right? And then out of the blue that came and that really kind of hurt them pretty badly. And then everything after that became pretty challenging, I must say. And I was, you know, I was the CEO of the first set of people who bought them out of um, the auction. It's interesting, right? I mean, the last five years, if you go back and look at, uh, this set of companies, and this is self-serving for me to say, but perhaps journalistically the best time was the 18 months when Univision was running it. They had lots of other issues. They were like funding the newsroom, they were growing, oh, everybody got raises, and everybody felt like the journalism was fine. But there are lots of other issues. I mean, Univision was a big company, and then when Univision decided it doesn't want to be in the English language business, that caused a set of uh, issues. With Go Media, look, I, I think they looked at the they looked at the cost structure uh, of these newsrooms. They looked at the price at which they were buying them. They looked at the audience, and I said, they said to themselves, we think we can reduce costs. We can increase page views. We had more video and all of that. And then the programmatic, we can probably make way more money than Univision ever was ever making. I think that was the fundamental principle. Most people don't understand what is the true value of the Gizmodo Media Group sites, right? It is the unbelievably rare combination of relevance and longevity, which is actually not that common in, uh, in digital sites. You have a lot of sites that have been around for a long time, Huffington Post or the sites of big media brands, so they, are, they have longevity. And then you have sites like Vice and Vox and BuzzFeed that are relevant but haven't been around that long. But if you look at the Gawker portfolio, the Onion is there for 30 plus years, right? The number one satire site. Jezebel has been around for, I think, 12, 13 years. The number one feminist site, or number two, depending on how you look at it. Deadspin, again, 
clearly in the top two or three, Gizmodo in the top two or three. So it's a very interesting combination of relevance and longevity. And the other reason why these sites succeed is they're all head fakes, meaning Deadspin is a sports site that does not cover much of actual sports, has no scores, but is about the culture of sports. Right? Kotaku is about the culture of gaming. So I think that's the beauty of these sites. And if you don't appreciate that, and that comes through the journalism, right? or comes to the fact that they have an amazing Kinja platform where it creates a lot of conversation. There'll be a 400 word post and 500 comments. So if people don't appreciate that that's what is giving them the audience and the, and the loyalty, and you come in and maximize, try to maximize page views, you will see what is happening right now there. You touched on the sports. Rafat, in a couple minutes, I want to ask you about the sticking to sports, if it's even possible in this era. But before we do, Kerry, I want to ask you a little bit again about you, you worked at these organizations. New York, we've heard, especially out of New York, but also LA and other places, is kind of drive towards unionization. All right. So do you think that that is actually a solution? Is it a safety net that's kind of myopic? Is the answer really for there to be a path to like, a, an ownership by the creators, you know, because so that they have a true seat at the table. Yeah. You know, I just I would love your take as somebody who's covered this space, covered these unionization drives, but also, um, you know, probably knows a lot of these people. So I'd love your take on Absolutely. that. Yeah, I think it's important to note with the case of, of Deadspin and, and Geo Media is that they GMG union, like of the the old like era, like is unionized, right? So there there are these protections in place, like they they have a contract, and the hope is that you know, they, they can actually follow through on that. Like I know when, when Deadspin um, went down and, and when they took, when the leadership took down a post, Barry, the editor, interim editor-in-chief at the time, argued that it violated their contract. Um, and that ended up not being so because in the contract there was a specification that posts can be taken down if it's like a board like vote that gets majority. And so, so you hope that these, you know, unionizations like help in, in matters like that, obviously, it wasn't perfect in that case. Um, but I, I think there's positive to that in having a, a seat at the table. I was just talking with a lot of Hearst staffers uh, because Hearst, the magazine giant, just unionized. And that is a giant union. It represents, I think, almost 500 employees. So, and the like, thing that everyone told me I spoke to is like, we just want a seat at the table. Like, we just want help in the transparency of the company. Like, we hope we can change some things about this company, but at least we want to know what's happening. Uh, and I think for for GMG and then GEO, like that was a case as well. At the same time, as much as they were told what happened, and I think to your point that you want to talk about the whole stick to sports thing, is Megan Greenwell, the old editor-in-chief, kind of warned that that was something that was happening sooner than later. Um, so even when you have a seat at the table, you can't necessarily change everything, but it's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> so that's, I think, why you see the rise of it. Look, I mean, the union, I think I'm glad it's there. Its biggest benefit has been to get severance. Mm -hmm. It has not been able to stop the job cuts and all of that. And I'm really disappointed that a bunch of Deadspin people quit, actually. If I were them, I would have hung around to make sure that the management pushes them out and then they get severance. Yeah. Right? So uh, from a union point of view. It seemed like that revolt, like they like tried to get fired arguably and Barry ended up getting fired. But... Right. So it's an interesting thing that you have a union and then all of you quit and then so there's no protection yeah. because of that, right? So I don't think the, the union has ever been an issue there. Sure, some things took longer than, um, and you had to kind of talk about it sometimes more than you no would normally do. But I don't think the union has come in the way of uh, either the business or any of those sites doing well. Or, so that's never been a real... I guess my question was more, is it a false sense of security? Because in the end, well, it hasn't... Really, that's really the point shown. I'm trying to make. Yeah, okay, which is, fair enough. Look, uh, the reason why I think unionization has really kind of taken hold in digital news companies, especially New York, is because all of us have had such shitty HR departments. So the union has become the default HR because they're kind of fighting for you and giving, asking for all these things because the HR department is kind of being 
totally asinine about yeah. it, right? And a positive to union too, like it depends, it's like it's committing to certain values, including like diversity and wages, like is something that you see throughout. And I think Vox Media is a good example of a ton of their employees ended up getting raises because of the severe pay disparity that happened and it was then outed and then guaranteed in their contract. So not to say there's not positives to unions, but I think the hope, like we were talking about, is the hope that you can change an organization. You can't change it as much as, as maybe people, people want to. So I want to ask you guys about what's happening with traditional media companies, them all going di direct to consumer, and if there's any parallels with journalists and creators also leveraging tools. We'll get to that in a second, but you can start thinking about that. Stick to sports. Would you ever tell your team stick to travel, you know, and don't talk, for example, as a parallel? And in this era where LeBron James, China, everything, like, is that even possible? Is like, and not just stick to sports specifically in debt spin. I'm saying is. Is it, is it like, is the future that Taylor Swift has to speak up about LGBTQ rights or is it no? Like, where are we going? Are we going where, because of cancel culture, which may not even really be a thing, that everybody's going to be in a shell and not say anything that offends? Or do you see in the future everybody having to be, not a militant, but everybody having to take a position on social issues and, and whatnot? Rafat, start with you. Um, I'm trying to sort of figure out what would the... Think of it with like, yeah. let's say, American Airlines CEO says something, yeah. and, and the, your writer it. wants to, and so where do yeah. you draw the so line? We co so we, we don't, I mean, we don't. Um, for us, the lens is always, does it affect the business of travel? So for those of you who don't know, Skift, Skift covers the business of travel. We're an industry-focused uh, media information company. So um, for us, travel, one of the things that we brought to the table when we came into this world uh, is look at travel in totality versus the sectors inside travel and travel's place in the larger world. And so uh, travel intersects with every sector in the world, has, has, has implications at all levels of, of society, etc. So for us, as we talk about the business of travel, we talk about it, it from a cultural, socio-political, economic, labor, all perspectives. So for us, stick to travel means talk about travel in a large like it doesn't really so to your point like when Donald Trump got elected like how can we not write about that <clears throat> and so the next morning I was in London I remember this distinctly when he got elected I wrote this whole essay sleepless night like we, sh we need to be activists in the path of travel mm -hmm. which is a line that got him stuck and so um, uh, so yeah so we cover all aspects of travel and you know, if we were just covering, oh, this cruise company launched this cruise thing, how boring will we be? I mean, this is just, you know, my, you know I would blow my mind. The uh, cruise industry is mind. offended <laughs> by your comment. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're not very cruise, uh, we have been very aggressive in the, on the cruise industry, for instance, uh, for all the reasons you can imagine. So, um, yeah. So do you think that it was actually a ruse to get rid of these employees, or do you think they actually felt that sticking to sports, which that's been was not really even about, was it them not knowing the, chat, the the brand, or was it more like, hey, this is a good, convenient way to get rid of these troublemakers, so yeah. to speak? So my understanding is that the the management wanted to like challenge ESPN. Like their understanding is that they saw a white space in the, the sports media industry, which is fascinating because no, the sports media industry is like pretty strong, um, and uh, ESPN is is growing really well and doing a lot. But that's from my understanding from talking to people who were at Deadspin at the time. Um, but and I think that's what's interesting is like I think you brought up a great point is like Deadspin did did have like a lens and loyalty. Mm -hmm. They covered sports culture, and that, that's you unique in a way so like losing that is weird and it's not to say they didn't cover like sports they did stick to sports arguably mm -hmm. they exactly. use that as a lens to cover so much and I think the strongest media companies out there are outlets that have to your point have like a really unique brand and you don't want to have a reader like go to deadspin.com or go anywhere and be like why are they writing this <laughs> you know like and, and I think deadspin was one of the best outlets and you knew why they were writing it they also had a good sense of who their audience was, and I think that gave them the comfort to say, if I write a story about X or Y that may not be directly about this, I know this audience will appreciate it, and write it in a tone and in a way, in your faceness that the sites have, that it'll, it'll be read and it'll be kind of discussed, I think. And sometimes they overdid it, but it just, you know, once in a while it's okay. And right after Trump won, all of our sites were writing about Trump, and we would get the occasional reader feedback saying, you know, I've come here to escape from that, right? So I think, but if you put on the prism of a, like a advertising 
kind of salesperson or then there is an issue sometimes saying that you sold the site based on it to be about this and there's a bunch of stories that are not about that so there could be some friction there but that's again the, I think the beauty of these sites were that they were about zeitgeist and culture and what people were talking about and written in such a way that they understood their audience if you don't appreciate that and you stick to these very firm rules saying this is not sports you are actually undermining the reason why these sites are successful the other thing, one thing that doesn't get talked about, and you have to be sort of inside the, the, the media business to understand this, the people who are now, we're talking about whether it's Spanfeller or Levinson, et cetera, et cetera, are operating from a playbook that is either Web 1.0 mm. or at best early stages of Web 2.0. And so the playbook that they're stuck with is an old playbook. It's sort of stopped at demand media. And the world has completely changed since then. And so, um, and I think that that is what Spanfeller was trying to bring, an old school thing. Levinson with Maven Maybe. and others, that's also sort of blew up on their face uh, as well. And, you know, I covered that era. So I know exactly what the playbook was. Uh, and so I think a lot of people are, because these are still the people that were there 20 years ago, that's what the world is changing them. I'm going to ask two more questions. If anybody has any questions, please let us know. And then in the next panel, Wall Street Journal's Sahil Patel is going to talk to me about I don't know what, because I would never dare tell a journalist what we should talk about. So that's coming up soon. Uh, I was going to talk about DTC, but you brought up uh, Ross Levinson and Jim Spanfeller, two white men. A lot of ink was c covering the fact that when Spanfeller came in, he replaced a lot of people, people of color, with his white men crony. It was like that was the theme nonstop. So um, I purposely didn't want to have a panel of four white guys sitting here either. Um, so let's start with, is that unfair in this story? Um, or no, that is a, I, I think your point is excellent, well, that by is the way. I, that, that's exactly the point. This is they're reaching into the networks that they grew up with, which has changed. And so the fact that their networks were all white guys is just the fact of that was their network. But you talked about the playbook. The fact that there was the, like, it was consequential, or you think, no, 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 that actually comes into play with it being successful or not? Because there's a strategy of like, yeah, the, web, the demand media exactly, but that doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that it's a bunch of white guy execs now. So I'm talking more about specifically like how much of a role does diversity and inclusion really play in this story or it doesn't matter it's more about strategy well you if you're so this is the this is the world that we exist in today like how can you have a media company today that is not diverse is there any way to exist today i mean this is an aoc world that we live in and so um whether we like it or not and so uh this is this is the new playbook that constantly keeps changing in you. So you have to um, be cognizant of, even if you think the executives that are gonna come are, are amazing, uh, that will help transform this company and I'm gonna make up diversity in other ways, turns out you really can't. So. So, yeah, to give credit to like white men, like there's a lot of nuance here, right? And I think you brought up a great point: <laughs> is that um, like the, the the issue of the past is that a lot of people in the power were white men. So like, yeah, if you're bringing your your cronies, as as maybe Deadspin writers would say, there's the odds they would be that. But like to give credit, like you can be a white man and still care about diversity and still hire people who have diverse thought from you. One thing that really like I was amazed by is um, I got like an internal memo for when um, shortly after Spanfeller took over. And he, it was a draft memo of the values that he thought for uh, GO, and none of those values were diversity. And that's just like really sad to see, like in this day and age, because I mean we talked about unionization, like diversity is usually always a part of it, as as in my opinion it should be. And so that was a clear red flag that that he wasn't prioritizing that. And that's not to say that a white man couldn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no one asking. Let's not you forget Nick Denton was white. No. So just to be clear, um, look, I mean, past success is the only guarantee of failure, future failure, right? And so you come from Forbes and you bring in certain people you are comfortable with and at least to get going, I think that model, as Rafat says, is like the Forbes model is like totally broken, right? That was just pump up page views and do all sorts of nonsense in terms of user experience, which looks like they tried to replicate here. And this is an audience that is actually very, very discerning about user experience at, on the Kinja website. 
So I think that's, again, I think it fundamentally, if you're focused on like the costs and page views and top line, you miss what is it that got them there. And I think that's the fundamental misunderstanding here. Mm -hmm. But when they've got it for whatever, 30, 40 million, maybe they thought, you know, for the price we're getting, we could really make this work. According to the Wall Street Journal, 27.5 <laughs> million. So last question, there's uh, one last question, then we're gonna go to the floor. Um, so right now you're seeing media companies blow up their business effectively and go direct to consumer, Disney Plus and all that. Is there a parallel for journalists and writers to tap into Kickstarter, Patreon, whatever, just, you know, subscriptions, all the wonderful tools that are out there and just say, enough's enough, I wanna be in control of my own destiny. I'm going to be a storyteller, a journalist, a reporter, but you know, do it myself. Essentially become an entrepreneur about it. Is did that you, realistic? Did you miss the last 20 years of my career? <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here, but, but okay. But what's interesting, and okay, Jason Calacanis, who kind of went on a rant on Twitter and you chimed in, that's actually for the context. You highlight, I mean, you've done it, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, blogging sort of, in the digital world, blogging brought that, right? Which is individual journalists being able to break from large companies or never go to large companies and create their own media. I mean, that is not a new phenomena. Um, and so, what was your question again? No, I guess when, when you hear the tone of the debt spin writers, many of whom I oh, read Jason and like- said, why don't you guys start your own yeah, thing? Yeah, do you think that that's ultimately the takeaway, that these guys just need to stop the woe is me, and I'm just exaggerating to make that point, and just be like, I'm gonna take control of my own destiny and do this, which not everybody is an entrepreneur, but everybody kind of has to think entrepreneurially. Do you think that's actually an outlet and an option, or do you think that'll just that's not gonna happen? Fundamentally, these guys are waiting for somebody to come write them a check. Yes, the answer is yes. I do agree with Jason, if not his tone. Yeah, the tone was off, but the point, okay, so you agree. I mean, there's, I think there's choices, like we're like journalists are humans, like they can decide like whether or not they want to start their own media business, which is hard, like not as easy as it sounds to all maybe hopefully try to get hired by another outlet, which isn't easy these days, or to yeah, start their own thing. I think one thing there was a camaraderie at, as there is at many media companies to like, you're losing your family by by not you know working together. But I think one thing that's that is unique about media, like you said, it's not new to like be your own blogger. Like Mashable, my former employer, was started by one guy who, who made a company. Um, but you have so many more tools to make money off of that. You know, like Substack is a newsletter company that has gained a lot of traction, and I know a lot of. Uh, people who have left their their stable cushy cushy media jobs to start their own newsletter projects, and it, it's great that they're able to make revenue from that. I know even WordPress, the blog site yesterday, just announced that they're allowing for for recurring payments to that. Yeah, so that I, I think to the argument is it, it's never been easier to kind of start mm -hmm. to do that, though it's not easy <laughs> in this crowded media landscape. And several of them, I think, have ended up at Vice and a few other places already, or at New York Times. Actually, you'd be amazed at the number of Gizmodo Media group people who are at the New York Times now. Uh, so I think some of the writers and some of the talented newsbreakers would all get like pretty good jobs. It is hard to become an entrepreneur and start out. I mean, it's easy to start it. It's hard to sustain it. I think that's the real issue and it's an open issue. I believe we had a question there. Yeah. Uh, so for a review, um, so like to me, the dead spin thought feels like actually quintessence is like an okay boomer. What's different about this situation? Yeah, I mean, look, Univision at the parent level uh, is funded by private equity. In fact, the largest private equity groups are big owners. And the original plan was um, to build out an English language, non-television business, and in 2020, give or take, to do an IPO of the whole company with the English language being the growth engine, if you will, right? And then uh, most people don't kind of haven't picked up on this as well, but when Trump won, Univision went from being this very important centrist television network to the extreme left, to the left of MSNBC, because it was all about DACA and Hispanics and, right? So politically, they became on the fringes. Two, simultaneously, the FCC around them told TV companies, you can merge with whoever you want, and we really don't care. And within short order, you had AT&T, CNN, you had Sinclair Tribune that didn't go through, but you had Disney, Fox. 
So from being this independent centrist television network, they became this like tiny, um, extremely to the left network. So the board had a you know internal debate, and the faction that had brought me in and wanted to do this and take three years lost to the faction that said we can't really afford to wait for three years, guys. So at like an April board meeting, they decided, and I was told, you can run this and cut it by half and sell it eventually. And I'm like, I just built this up. I emotionally also, I wasn't the right guy. So I had it out. So it wasn't really a financial issue at a GMG level. It was just a parent company changing its mind. Look, I mean, first year, um, we invested a lot of money back into video because we didn't have any capacity. But based on year one numbers, I, I beat the bu internal budget by 16%. So it wasn't like a performance issue at that time. Just But look, companies change their minds, right? That's the reality of uh, this business. I think with Go Media, one of the mistakes, if I were there, that I wouldn't have done is I wouldn't have cut as much as they cut and then sold it, right? Because then when you are a new owner, ideally you want them to come in and think there is value and cost savings. But when they came in, it was pretty lean already. So anything they do now has to, so the first thing they did was laid off all the top editors because they looked at the payroll. So that's the kind of stuff that backfires pretty quickly. And then I think they were looking for programmatic um, revenue, which means that you have to have certain volume, you have to do certain things like they implemented a, like a auto, auto play of video, which was a huge internal thing because we didn't want to do that. So that's the kind. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that I think that destroys value in the long term, but maybe they're not thinking long term. I don't know that. I, I've spoken to Jim Spanfer once before he acquired this thing, but look, Jim is the guy who ran, who took, uh, who bought ads on sides of buses in New York and at that time said Forbes.com has more audience than WSA.com. And I was yeah, at WSA.com. I remember that. Right? <laughs> so that's his kind of view of how to manage media. So not exactly 2019. Yeah, look, I think they're, they're fairly well compensated people at GMG because they were all doing very well, relatively speaking, as individual performers. So you're right. I mean, they're, diff they're all in different stages of their life right now. So some of the younger folks could decide that they can, they can do that. But I think to the point that was made earlier, there are more means to try out individual things now and kind of make money, whether it's a newsletter or any of those, than they were before. Look, prima donnas have always existed, right? I was at the Washington Post and Bob Woodward, took a salary of a dollar, but still worked for the Washington Post. He could have easily gone out and done his own thing. And then I hired Ezra Klein and Melissa Bell, and they decided that they could, they don't need the Washington Post, and they went off and did walks. So I think there are more opportunities now, but you're right, individuals have to make the call saying that, you know, I have kids, I live in New York, and I rent, and I have all of that. So it might be easier said than done. for the disgruntled billionaire aspect of this? And like how, like, how much money conceivably does one need as an independent media organization that's starting today to have a billionaire you know, liability tax built into it? Like, what kind of legal do you need to really do the same thing? Because Gawker didn't have investors before this happened. It was an independent media company for more than a decade, and then this happened. I'll answer that in the Q&A with Sahil, if you don't mind, because we are exposed to copyright, fair use. So I have a very specific answer to that. But because okay. these folks are here, I'd like you guys to answer that. 
Look, I think, I remember when I got there, I think there was a little bit of a sense of pride in getting sued. And my point was that we should do journalism that doesn't get you sued, right? If you get sued after that, then we'll fight it, but don't aspire to do journalism that gets sued. Right? Yeah, or do it in a way that you know you you cross your T's and you have all of the normal legal stuff. So during the, I mean, looks they've been sued since then. For example, the same set of journalists, but they've not lost a single lawsuit because the practices were, I think, much more. Kind of, there was a standard. So there was a bit more of like uh, you know adult behavior, if you will, in some of those you know, in that journalism. So to your question, you know, what will it take to fight billionaires? It all depends on how good your journalism is. If it is good, it doesn't, you know, you could fight, you could win those cases, except, you know, occasionally in Florida, where if you lose it, then you're in trouble, like Gawker was. Um, I think, to your point, there have been lawsuits. I just read, like, the <laughs> Splinter, like, officially shut down yeah. today, and, and one of their managing editors is like, I got sued, and we won. Like, you know, so it's not to say, like, you, you could be a media company who's, like, pretty edgy, maybe get sued, but hopefully win them. The Peter Thiel, and I, you know, I think you brought up a good point. We didn't discuss it, and I think it's, it, as someone who's written enough about Dustin and, and the whole like saga now, is you, you can't not like mention the lawsuit and what happened. Like when I've written about it, CNN uses a lot of video. Like I've put the, the gawker, like Peter Thiel explainer at the top because it's an important part of the story um, to understand how we got where we are today. Um, but I think to your point, like there, you hope that if these people started again, they could do what they're doing but try not to get sued. But the first person I hired when I became CEO was a general counsel who knew First Amendment very well, and she's Lynn Overlander. She's one of the best in the... So I think you do certain things to make sure that you don't ever get back into that same predicament. Any other... You want to comment on that, or...? Well, I have completely contrarian views, but... No, but then let's hear them. That's what we want. Yes, like I've always said that um, fake news, billionaires trying to destroy media are all head fakes in the larger scheme of things. Because they all distract from the fundamental question, which is how do we create media that is quality that survives and thrives? Whether fake media issue is solved or not, it doesn't solve the issue of creating sound media companies that can be built. So one of the things I've said is the, two, the media's obsession with fake news, real issue is not going to solve their problems of creating sound media companies. So don't obsess over it. Continue to do what you do best, which is quality work. And so attacks on media from Trump. Sure, great. Obviously, we have to worry about it. But does that solve the fundamental issue of creating media companies that do quality work that then survive and thrive? So uh, you know, I'm sure you can poke hundred holes in it. But that's my whole thing is keep your head down and do your shit versus worrying about the world that is around you. I promise to answer that in phase two. You were you had a question and then over there and then we'll if there's no more we'll wrap. Quick comment. Sure. It just goes back to the, the original Gawker stuff. Um, totally and just uh, tell just tell said. everybody who you are. Uh, um, as a founding CTO of Gawker Media, so I was there for involved in it for 13, 14 years. A long time. I sat across the table from one of the league. Yeah. <laughs> Launch that's been like months prior. But um, one of the things, just to comment real quick, like prior to the lawsuit, um, nobody at Gawker ever wanted to get sued. You know, it wasn't a thing of pride. I think it was a surviving of it mm -hmm. that people turned around like we can survive this. Um, and didn't survive in the form we wanted to be in. But I think that that's probably the culture that you were, you were working with was that post that kind of survived it and you know, there's pride in it. Prior to that, we were not looking to get, you know, to get into these entanglements the whole bit. Um, but this kind of engagement with a person like Peter Thiel for what happened, um, it's just really like what ended up happening over the years. Yeah, I mean, there was uh, this newsroom felt like the world was against them. Yeah. And that's what I meant by PTSD. I mean, it's just a very hard thing to. Then you have this like thing for everything, yes. right? So that, so it kind of it's a self-reinforcing behavioral thing. Last question before the next session. <laughs> hey guys, I was just wondering if anybody has any comments or point of view about um, the trend of you know editorial moving towards um, these new platforms, but other OTT streaming platforms, especially mobile, obviously, which could be launching that next spring. Do you think there's like a trend of more active type of content moving towards those platforms? 
so OTT as in the video players like HBO Max and all these others? Yeah. Um, I haven't tweeted this out yet, but I'll say it live. I think all of them will fail. Um, <laughs> uh, the only one standing will be Netflix. Not even Disney Plus? No. Interesting. Care to expect? No. <laughs> That's it? You gotta follow him yeah. on the Twitter. Well, I think it's, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned like, Axios, like there's, there's been success stories, you know, I, I know you said the Times is a great success story, it's like I would argue like Axios is a great success story of a new media company so far that has found its way and, well, and has already... Well, success, it's two years old. You, yeah. True. They haven't failed yet, and they've had they've been able to grow partnerships that we were talking earlier about, like the HBO, like Axios deal, right? Like they've kind of like moved into video in, like smartly, not not because they got a ton of money from someone, and they're like, oh, let's make a ton of video. They like strategize very well, and so despite the argument of like, yeah, maybe Quibi will fail, but some media companies are like, ooh, look a check, like, and are like making some interesting content and getting paid for it. Who knows if it'll last? But there's. There's successful stuff happening in that space. Yeah, I mean, my, my theory of media sustainability is, uh, and Rafat is an example of that, is that media companies can make money in like 10 to 15 different ways, depending on how you count those. And if you can have six or seven or eight of those revenue streams, each of them would be challenged because there's no virgin space left, but each of them would be challenged for different reasons at different times. But collectively, you can have a sustainable growing business. So I think that's the only way to think about it, rather than say, this binary of like whether you go OTT or not kind of a model. Yeah, and I also think Axios as a content provider is a bit different than Quibi as a platform that will license the content. I do think fundamentally you're gonna have Netflix that will more or less own the SVOD space and still have enough of a base, and you're gonna have YouTube that will own the AVOD space. The only wild card for me is like an HBO and a Disney because they just have so much content that if they stick to it over three, four years, when those rights come back, um, I think you will see maybe those guys also standing. But the bigger question is, will it be a bigger business than their current business? Or will it be a smaller business, but just that has better margins because it's direct to consumer, right? But I do think from an entrepreneurial storytelling, this, this is the greatest time to be in, in, in that business of storytelling because you can go direct to your consumer, you can have tools, you don't need to go convince somebody. You know, you get to, you know, you need a lot of drive, you need a lot of persistence, uh, you'll get rejected quite a bit, but I think it's the greatest time to be a storyteller. That's great for Matt because he's just launched a video series on Social Media Cool. <laughs> All right. Yes, question. Yes. Quick no. question. Um, thank you for all this. It's a great time for storytelling and media journalism. But I wanted to ask what, because um, we also talked about quality for this. And so, who's the arbiter? How do you determine in a world where anybody, where the entrepreneurial direction thing that's important, where popularity can be mistaken for uh, quality? In journalism, who's the arbiter? How do you determine what quality? But I think, if anything, the last two years have shown that popularity is not a proxy to quality at all. From whose perspective? Though? From everybody's perspective. All of the companies that were doing slideshows are gone. Demand media is gone. All of these companies are gone. So Outbrain and Taboola type crap is essentially now one company. So I think popularity as a proxy to quality has been completely been false at this stage. So your question has been answered, I would, I would humbly say, which is that um, all the stuff that was used to drive page views are now coming empty because the underlying economics of it is so tiny and small and doesn't give money to them, programmatic being one part of it. Um, programmatic bubble is burst five times over at this stage. Yeah. So I do think that, very valid question, the good news has been answered. Any other questions to answer that quality? I was going to jump in on the yeah, quality part. I think we talked about billionaire owners, and you mentioned like Bezos. I think one thing that that happened pretty early when I joined CNN is the the ending of the Washington Post Express, which was their like daily commuter paper. And speaking of quality, people loved that. Like in DC, you know, it was like this like cult following of people. So that's not to say that you know like just because your quality means you can survive, you know, like and and to going back to the point of like billionaire owners, just because you have a billionaire owner doesn't mean that owner won't cut things that are not profitable. Right. So it's it's hard, you know, like you, there as much as you want things to succeed, no matter what, there are certain businesses we're in. You know, you mentioned like we're in the, the world of programmatic, where like that wasn't a programmatic offering; it was a print thing, and it's it's hard to do print these days to keep it simple. Very right. good. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.